Good morning all. Today we are going to look at the topic feminism in Nigeria, a historical perspective. Feminism is a belief or ideologies that seek to achieve equality among the sexes, both men and women. If there are opportunities, political opportunities for men, it must also be extended to women. If there are educational opportunities for men, it should also be extended to women. There is this argument that the society has been hostile to women, that men have been taking it on. For instance, they argue that men are more educated than women. Men control political parties. Men control economic parties. But we have to say this, that the current study that depicts women as docile, if we go historically, it may not be true because before the advent of colonialism, Christianity and Islam, women in Africa had powers Women in, uh, in Nigeria controlled land. Women in Nigeria had leadership positions. For instance, before the advent of colonialism, women participated actively in the private and public spheres and usually have independent access to resources. Among the Yoruba, women were central in trade. And according to Professor Falola, Yoruba women were the major figures in long-distance trade with enormous opportunities for accumulating wealth and acquiring titles. The most successful among them rose to the prestigious chieftaincy title of Iyalode, a position of great privilege and power. To be sure, Nigerian women were not as docile and powerless as contemporary literature tends to portray them. For instance, the conservative northern Nigeria, where the voices of women had been lost through the instrumentality of Islam, once had a prominent woman as Queen. Queen Amina became the undisputed ruler of Zao Zao, a Hausa city in northern Nigeria. Distinguished as a soldier and an empire builder, she led campaigns within months of becoming a ruler. Amina subdued the whole area between Zao Zao and the Niger and Benue rivers, absorbing the Nupe and Pararafa states. The Igala Kingdom, also in northern Nigeria, was reputed to have been founded by a woman, Ebele Ejiono. Similarly, in Igbo land, before the advent of colonialism, the women occupied enviable positions. For instance, Professor Okonjo argued that political status bearing roles were not totally the preserve of men in Igbo land. According to her, the functions of the Obi, the male monarch, and the Omu female monarch were parallel and complementary, with each managing the affairs of his or her cells. This arrangement was changed by the colonial administrators who recognized the Obi and placed him on monthly salary, thereby eroding the powers and authority of the female monarch. The Igbo Women's Rebellion or protest, also known as Saba Women's Riot of 1929, was as a result of the British introduction of certain rules and regulations which weakened the enjoyment of social economic and political rights of Igbo women. Drawing from the above narrative, the central thesis of this lecture, or the position of this lecture, is that African women enjoyed status parity with men in different areas until they lost it with the advent of the Europeans and their colonial policies, which favored mostly men. Therefore, the study is set to historically investigate 
the prominent role women played in the past before the advent of colonialism and its turbulent impact on women. The study will also examine the contemporary role of women in Nigeria and their contributions to feminist movements and other platforms they adopted to making themselves relevant once again. To achieve this objective, the lecture has been divided into sections. With this introductory overview, the lecture pro uh, proceeds to examine why women lost their exalted status in Africa. After that, we shall proceed to conceptualize the word feminism in order to limit the level of ambiguity, which as a rule is the hallmark of academic lectures. We want to now look at the reasons why women lost their exalted status in Africa and in Nigeria. Having established historically that women in Africa and Nigeria enjoyed great privileges before the arrival of the Europeans with their patriarchal rule and system that placed women on the disadvantaged position. The lecture will briefly examine how the Europeans themselves viewed their own women before feminism as a concept was introduced in their polity. At a time in Europe, serious doubts were raised, according to Professor Owuga, as to whether women were actually humans and should be so recognized. The doubt was carried to an absurd extent when, in 856 AD, a world conference was held in France to discuss the issue. It was finally resolved that women are human beings, but were actually created for the purpose of serving men. The European bias against women is also demonstrated in the reaction of royal families to the birth of a boy and that of a girl. For instance, Professor Ashworth reports that the birth of a prince is greeted with 21 gun salute, while that of a princess is only 10. In other words, the modern European leaders were re adopting their earlier postulation or position of Aristotle that it is the male element that has full human element. By implication, Aristotle holds that women are nothing else but matter set in motion by and for the soul of the unified male, for the end of the male, that is patient. Thus, between 18th and 19th centuries, when the Europeans scrambled and partitioned Africa for themselves, European women had completely been disadvantaged through the establishment of European patriarchal system, which emphasized masculine superiority. So it was proper for the European colonial administrators to diminish the status of Nigerian women through colonial policies, which only favored Nigerian men. Only, as can be expected, colonial policies became an instrument of elevation and demotion. It promoted the men and reduced the influence of women to nothingness. For instance, Professor Chazen argued that colonialism divided the society alongside lines with the introduction of male-dominated politics and ignored the African women's political and economic activities. This placed women at a disadvantage and led to the subordination by defining them as the words of men, by eroding and denying them the power and authority they previously enjoyed. Colonialism reinforced the subordination of African women. Similarly, Falola argued that the male chiefs also collaborated with the British colonial administration in collecting taxes and governing 
the position of female chiefs declined in importance. When the economy became increasingly geared towards the production of cash crops for export, Nigerian men and the European firms dominated the distribution of rubber, cocoa, groundnut, and palm oil. Women pushed to the background were forced to shift to the production of subsistence crops. A previous land tenor that had prevented land alienation gave way to land commercialization, favoring those with access to money gained from the sale of cash crops. Western-style education also favored boys over girls and thus largely excluded women from many of the new occupations introduced by colonialism. Missionary education during the colonial era and continued in the post-colonial Nigeria has been described by some as the single most important policy that adversely affected women in relation to men. It reinforced the sociocultural traditional practice of stressing the acquisition of housekeeping skills in preparation for marriage and serving as a good wife to educated men. To this end, women were discouraged from taking courses or subjects that will prepare them for participation in Western style politics and access to well paying jobs that will enhance their economic independence. Such discipline as law, medicine, engineering, political science, which provide intellectual skills needed for politics and well paying jobs, where they preserve of men. Women are thus, through the educational process, screamed out of elective and appointed positions, as well as from access to well paying jobs that will enhance their economic independence. Having traced the origin of how African women in general and Nigerian women in particular lost their exalted power position to men, which they are trying to regain through their feminist movement, we shall turn our attention to knowing what feminism is all about. Feminism, conceptual clarification. Feminism, according to Hawksworth, is a range of political movements, ideologies, and social movements that share a common goal to define, establish, and achieve political, economic, personal, and social equality of sexes. To Friedman, feminism is a belief that although women and men are inherently of equal worth, most societies privilege men as a group. And lastly, Smith looks at feminism as the political theory and practice to free all women, women of color, working class women, poor women, physically challenged women, lesbians, old women, as well as white, economically privileged, heterosexual women. Anything less than this, according to Smith, is not feminism, but mere female self-aggrandizement. In summary, we can infer from all the definitions above that feminism is a movement to create a world where gender does not affect one's ability to achieve one's goals. Regardless of gender, men and women should be able to live a harmonious society. Thus, feminism is all about equal standard for all people, regardless of gender. This includes seeking to establish educational and professional opportunities for women that are equal to those of men. Charles Fourier, a utopian socialist and French philosopher, is credited with having coined the word feminism in 1837. 
the word feminism or feminism and feminists first appeared in France and the Netherlands in 1872, Great Britain in 1890s, and the United States in 1910. And the Oxford English Dictionary listed, lists it in 1852 as the year of the first appearance of feminists and 1895 for feminism. Depending on the historical movement, historical moment, culture, and country, feminists around the world have had different causes and goals. Most Western feminist historians contend that all movements working to obtain women's rights should be considered feminist movement, even when they did not or do not apply the term to themselves. Other historians assert that the term should be limited to the modern feminist movement and its descendants. Those historians use the label proto-feminist to describe earlier movements. Having seen the different perspective, we are now going to look at the role and contributions of women in the socio-economic development of Nigeria. When we say that Nigeria became a signatory to the United Nations in 1979 convention, known as Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. This convention, according to Ozibo, has variously been described as the Bible of Women Empowerment and Women's International Bill of Rights. Having been empowered by the acquisition of Western education, Nigerian women have made significant contributions in all the sectors of the polity. In education sector now, female lecturers and teachers are on the increase. Our novels are no longer dominated by male writers. Some of the Nigerian female writers that have achieved international recognition include, but not limited to this, Florence Mwakba, Amina Mama, Shimamanda Adishe, Ayobami Adebayo, Bushi Emesheta, Mabel Shegu, Zainab Akali, and others. In the political sector, Nigerian women have been progressively climbing the political ladder. In recent years, women's participation in politics and decision-making has received significant attention across the world. Hence, in 1995, a declaration was made for a 35% increased affirmation action of women representation globally at the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, China. However, women remain severely underrepresented in the decision-making process and positions in Nigeria. Despite women making up about 49% of Nigerian population, Nigeria still records the lowest number of women in active politics, with a miserly 4% in politics, and ranking 133 in the world survey of female political representatives. Increasingly, there are now more women in managerial position in various governmental establishments. This gives a prospect for more position for women at top levels in future. Few establishments have been privileged to be held by women in this country, and they stood out in terms of output. The transformation of the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAVDAC, by the late Professor Dara Akunyele, cannot be overemphasized. Dara was able to stand up and say no to fake drugs and missed all challenges. In the Ministry of Finance, the former minister, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, brought serious transformation and transparency that made Paris Club, a group of bilateral creditors, to pay $12 billion of Nigeria's external debt in return for 8 billion Naira debt rewrite off. 
when she served as finance minister in the administration of former president Olusegun Obasanjo. In the business sector, Nigerian women have shown aggressive presence in the way they did the, in the pre-colonial era. Recall that we accepted in the introductory part of this study that women played central role in the trade before the advent of the Europeans. The most successful among the Nigerian women of Yoruba extraction rose to the prestigious chieftaincy title of Iyalode, a position of great privilege and power. Today, Nigerian women are soaring greatly in business and financial institutions. Today, Nigerian women are soaring greatly in businesses and financial institutions. We have to conclude this lecture. And we said that this lecture has examined and assessed the feminist struggle in Nigeria, historical origin, contributions of the women and their impediment and challenges. The lecture analyzed the meaning of feminism for easy understanding of the concept. The different theories and frameworks on feminism were also analyzed. The study believes that for the role and contributions of women to be sustained, Nigerian political, traditional, and religious leaders should help him to the advice of Hillary Clinton, the former secretary of the United States of America, who authoritatively declared that what we are learning around the world is that if women are healthy and educated, their families will flourish. If women are free from violence, their families will flourish. If women have a chance to work and earn as full and equal as partners in the society, their families will flourish. And when families flourish, communities and nations will flourish. Therefore, if communities and nations must flourish, government should adopt gender mainstreaming as a strategy for women development. Gender mainstreaming is the process of ensuring that gender is taken into account in all government policies, programs, and interventions. It involves bringing into account the experiences, concerns, knowledge, and interest of women and men to bear on programming in all areas and at all levels. It addresses the underlying roots, causes such as gender stereotype and social norms that perpetuate and compound inequality and distribution. Gender mainstreaming includes removing restrictions to women's mobility, providing full access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, ensuring access to education and employment opportunities, as well as access to economic resources, such as land and financial services. Nigerian leaders should lay more emphasis on educating both men and women on the desirability of gender equity for sustainable development. If this is done, then the aim of feminist movement in Nigeria, which is establishing and defending equal political and economic opportunities for men and women would have been achieved. Thank you so much.